finally this presence behind me comes up to my left, I know it's Jesus. I couldn't see him, couldn't turn my head, I could, but I knew him better than I've known anyone on earth. He was my home, where I came from, where I was going. I was home. And instead of him telling me, well, you screwed up, now you're dead, or these are all things you did wrong, or let me just real quickly without explanation throw you into the pit of hell. He was just like talking to me, like as if a best friend would sit down and talk to you. And he was saying things like, I created you to be colorful and creative and artistic and, and quirky and dorky. I love that about you. I created that because I delight in it. And that's not a mistake. That's who you were created to be. This is my friend, Melissa. Hi. I've been doing this series on things nobody tells you about marriage. Mm. And the Lord really highlighted you because you have a really powerful testimony just with walking through addiction for the first, what, 10 years of your marriage functioning and finding Jesus in the midst of that and even having to surrender over your desire for your husband and kids to come to know Jesus. We would love to hear about your journey and we'll go from there. Oh my gosh, we got married in 2003. Okay. And we got married really young. We were 21, really young to have a family and all that. We came into our marriage with our own baggage. Yeah. I definitely had a lot of baggage he didn't know about. We didn't do things traditionally. We moved in together within four days of dating. We were engaged in two months. Wow. A few years later, we're married, and we there's still so much we didn't know about each other. I was intimidated by my husband's healthy family. He has great parents, always super involved and supportive. My parents, yeah. they weren't like that. I didn't realize the relationship I had with my parents wasn't normal mm. until I was with him and his family. Right. It started to open old wounds. I had pushed down really deep. There was a lot of physical, mental, sexual abuse, and I hadn't really talked to my husband about it. I was afraid if I told him who I really was, he wouldn't like me, or maybe I wasn't clean to be with someone so good and wholesome, you know. Were either of you walking with Jesus at the beginning? Oh, no. He was quite adamant that we didn't have a pastor priest at our wedding. I was the same way. My family was Catholic, but I never really understood what that meant. And then his experience was um, his parents, they did go to a church for a while when he was younger and then just stopped. And when he was 18, he went to a youth group and rekindled his relationship with the Lord. But there was a scandal with the youth pastor and it, it hurt him. It broke his heart. And he just was like, I'm never going back to church. My family being traditional Catholics didn't want me to get married without being it's it's seen that when you don't get married in the Catholic Church, it's almost like it's not real. Like your marriage uh -huh. isn't real because it wasn't blessed by God. Mm -hmm. Through the priest to appease my parents who didn't approve, we got a Christian youth pastor to officiate. We went to marriage counseling with him and his wife. It was his requirement okay. to marry us. And that was really interesting because, you know, we weren't living that lifestyle they yeah. were. And when we were in their home doing marriage counseling, it was obvious we were on a whole different planet. We even asked him um, not to talk about God in our wedding, um, just not to make it long and drawn out and religious. We just wanted to get married. Right. But he didn't listen. He ended up blessing us and prophesying. And you're and reaping the fruit of right? that blessing in that. You know, now we're so grateful. We're like, man, that was a total God thing, you yes. know. But so, yeah, I was dealing with a lot internally. My only solution was to start, you know, self-medicating. So for a while, it was just, you know, alcohol and marijuana. When I had my first son, all of my molestation stuff surfaced. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, my gosh, I was dreaming mm -hmm. about it. It was really hard to deal with. I went to see my doctor and they'd put me on depression medication or anxiety medication. And I was abusing everything. Yeah. My husband, he knew that I smoked weed and drank alcohol, but he is very much an enabler. Mm -hmm. So to this day, we, we are to each other. Even though it's gotten better, he didn't realize I was abusing other things. Mm -hmm. And I kept that a secret. It was normal in our life, and neither of us were surrendered to God, and we were living however we wanted. It was normal for me to come home from work, go in my room, smoke a bowl, and then come out and deal with my family, you know, because wow. I can put a smile on my face. I can be in the 
wonder of play with my kids on the floor because I was high yeah. and I wasn't feeling all the things or letting my mind, you know, take me somewhere else. But, and I don't know, I've never, I don't think I've asked Garrett if he noticed yeah. when I was high. I should ask him. I'm curious to have him share his point of view. We need more male perspectives yeah, as definitely. women because this channel focuses on inspiring women to grow in life, faith, and business. And these are the testimonies we need to hear. Yeah. This is a generation. We were at Destiny Conference the other a couple of days ago, and Pastor Alex was preaching, and he was giving statistics of Gen Z and millennials. They see right through everything's fake. They know life isn't perfect. It's right. not perfect after you give life to Jesus. They want the raw, honest. I agree with that. That's how I do ministry now. We had our first child in 2003. I was four months pregnant at my wedding. Wow. I was a, a young mom. Then we had Ethan three years later, and all of a sudden I'm I'm married, and I have two kids, and I have an amazing relationship with my husband and and support and everything. And then I just start to have these experiences where I'm feeling like I'm going to mess it all up. Like I'm broken. I'm going to mess it all up. I'm going to hurt my husband. I'm going to hurt my kids. And so without really realizing it for a long time, for several years, while abusing drugs and alcohol, whenever I'd be with my kids driving, playing or eating, I would try to prepare them to live a life without me. Yeah, it's so crazy. You know, and I think about it now and it's so tragic, but in, at that time it made sense. I wanted my kids to know that I love them, yeah. you know, no matter what, but that their dad was the best person mm -hmm. in the whole world and they were going to have a great life and their dad was someone they could come to for anything. It took me a while to realize I was doing that. I knew suicide was on my radar. That's another complicated emotion to explain. Because unless you're feeling it, mm -hmm. you don't know. People have said, oh, it's so selfish. You really don't know mm -hmm. what that person is going through. But I Did postpartum highlight it or? Yeah. You know, I never really thought about that. I mean, knowing I was pregnant brought a lot. Having my kids brought a lot. Being sexually abused brought up a lot to bathe my kids. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to hurt them. It was a culmination of everything. But the, what also magnified it before my near-death experience in 2008 was in 2006, my younger sister got engaged and wanted me in her wedding. I had stayed away from family funerals and weddings because I didn't want to see my abuser. Mm. I couldn't say no to my sister, you know, mm. so it was like, what an honor to be her maid of honor, but then I'd have to go and see all these people that I have so much pain yeah. from, you know. I didn't think it was a big deal. I was excited, but then that started revealing places I needed to be hurt. For example, I would have these nightmares where I was reliving those molestation experiences, crying and screaming in my sleep. My husband would have to wake me up and what what happened? What's wrong? You know, right. I remember a few times, clearly. One time I said, I'm just crying because I love you. And the other time I said, oh, I had a bad dream, yeah. you know. And then finally it kind of came to a head where it was probably like three or four in the morning and he had woken me up and I was so upset. And I just was like, why, why am I hiding this? I should be able to trust my husband with everything. Yeah. I ended up telling him it was a first cousin of mine older than me. He was so upset. He actually punched the wall. <laughs> he was so upset. He was, you know, you can't believe you've never told me this. I'm so sorry. And, yeah. and I feel like such a, a, you know, because he had met him previously and like mm -hmm. shook his hand mm -hmm. and talked mm -hmm. to him, you know, at a family thing. And it was just, it was really hard. When I realized this was like an issue, I decided to start seeing a counselor okay. to try to walk through this, navigate how to deal with it, especially because nobody in my family knew this cousin of mine was the son of a father who passed away young. He and his siblings were really coddled and loved by our family because they lost their dad and they were pretty on the straight, narrow road of getting an education, yeah. going off to college. And, and I wasn't. I was the runaway that had tattoos and did drugs and was living with a, and a man before I got married and all this stuff. So in right. my mind, no one's going to believe me. But what ended up happening is I figured there's no way I'm going to get through this wedding unless I, unless I can tell my family the what truth happened? and then make sure that this person isn't there because I don't know if I can, like, go to this wedding and be in front of everyone and not lose my mind. Right. I told my counselor I was going to tell my family, and she actually 
did not agree with me. She said, knowing from what I had explained about my relationship with my family, that they would not understand and it would cause more pain than good. But I took that as a form of rejection. I felt like my counselor was not on my side. And I was like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I called my family, said, I need to tell you something. I ended up driving. I got a babysitter for my kids, drove to a park, and I got a hold of... Because you were still in California Mm -hmm. at this point. Okay. Yeah, this was in 2006. I went to the park, parked my car. I got my cousin's phone number from a family member. And I called him. I said, you know who this is? And I don't want you to talk. You need to listen. I've carried this my whole life. And it's robbed me of all these things. My kids are going to be robbed of grandparents, cousins, aunts right. and uncles if I don't. Face this. And so I'm giving this back to you. He started to say something like, I understand. But then I hung up because I didn't want to hear anything. His voice was repulsive to me. So I drove and I was you know, hysterical, but I drove from there to my parents. And when I sat down to meet with my parents to talk about it, it wasn't the reaction. Yeah, it wasn't that, received. Right. Now, years later, I've had healing moments with my parents and I understand it differently. Right. But at the time, I felt like they were just like, my wish was... I'm not asking for him to be hurt. I want peace. I want you to know why I ran off. Yeah. I like, haven't come back. I need freedom. Yeah. I need to heal. And my kids need family. I was high when I went to see them. So my perception of everything I know was blurry. Yeah. But um, I ended up telling them and then the reaction was what it was. And what it did was cause me more pain. It didn't help the way I hoped. I started to slip into a deeper depression. I was really normal on the outside, but inside I was dying, sinking deeper into my depression and driving back to and from work. I would fantasize about running into a car, running into a tree. You know, how how can I end this quickly? Yeah. I was struggling with my boss and supervisor. I had been there 11 or 12 years in. And okay. my boss and my manager, they they were like, we need to have a sit down. Like something's not right with you. We're worried about you. We care about you. And they're like, we want you to take some time off. And, you know, in my mind, I'm getting fired. Nice. I've, I've lost my job. I'm the worst. They told me to take time off. I had to go home and heal. That wasn't helpful because I would get up and smoke a bowl, pop some pills around lunchtime, a lot of sleeping, crying. Did Garrett say anything? Yeah, I feel so bad. I put that man through so much. He... I, at that time, I started having really bad debilitating panic attacks to where I would, like, strip my clothes off and be trembling. It was out of control. I remember a couple of times he called his mom and he was like, I don't know what to do. Um, and he he just, he loves me so much. And he was just trying to, whatever you need, I got you. You know, you need more weed? I'll get you some more weed. You know, like, that's how he was. But, you know, we were dealing with it the best we could. But what what ended up happening is in the, in that break from when I was excused from work and giving my life to Christ. (laughs) My husband called one of my close friends in town and said, you know, can you come over and check on her? Can you hang out with her? Whatever. I remember my friend came over. She's one of my best friends. She's been my friend half my life, if not more. She came over laying on my bed and she was like, you need to pray. Let me pray with you. I was that person that if somebody said that to me, I'd be like, F you, take your prayers and get out of my house. I yeah. had so much anger towards yeah. God because when I was What's growing up, as a little girl, I have a vivid memory of being like, I don't know, maybe fourth grade. But I remember I had just been sexually abused and I remember laying in my bed by a window, looking up at the sky and seeing the stars being like, I know you're there. Why is this happening? Why can't this stop? When you're little, you know God. Mm -hmm. And at some point it gets grayed out and you forget, I knew he was there. Years later, I was bitter. My friend, she could take it. She changed the subject and said, hey, my doctor said I need to exercise. Is it all right if you come with me to this Mm -hmm. Zumba class? It makes me laugh because Zumba was such a crazy trend. It's still around. What was the other one? Like Tebow? I know what you're talking about. I was very young, though. Like the ball headed guy, the aerobics. Yes. There was all Was those. it Jimmy? It was like Jimmy Blanks or 
Uh, for all, I don't know. It was preposterous. And honestly, I would have never gone to Zumba class in my life. But even though I was a hot mess, I was still the friend that would be there for you if you needed it or whatever. Yeah. So I told her, yeah, I'll go with you to this stupid class. We end up going and it's in the gymnasium of this high school. Funny enough, it was the high school I went to. So it was kind of weird. The instructor was so far away from me. But I remember there was just something about this woman. She didn't smile. It wasn't super nice. But something about her drew me every time. And I wanted to talk to her. She actually, talking about fads, another fad at that time was when people would wear like rooster feathers in their hair. Oh my gosh. Remember that? No. In 2006, I was 11. Oh my gosh. And I'm old. I'm in the 40s club. They put feathers and it was different colors. Super cool. Boho. And I've always been a kind of a hippie. Yes. So like, I remember never seeing that before. And I was like, I don't care what's going on in here. I just want to know who did her hair, yes. you know? But every time I would go to talk to her, my lip would start shaking and I'd want to cry. And I would be like, what the heck? It made me mad. Eventually, I ended up telling my husband like all about her. And he was like, if I didn't know you were straight, I'd be worried. Because oh, really? I was like, Angie this, Angie that. And he was just like, okay. okay. That whole feeling bothered me so much mm. that I ended up just dropping out of the class. She must have been a believer. She was a believer. Yeah. She was a annoying yeah. Holy Spirit. <laughs> I didn't realize that's what I was doing. You're being I drawn to it. I end up dropping out of the class. Another week goes by. I remember one morning, really dark, really dark. I don't think I could make it to lunch. Wow. And I checked my email and I had this email from this Zumba instructor. I call her my angel, Angie. But she and she only had my email because of the roster when I signed up for her class. But she, she wrote, I really don't know why I'm doing this. I've never done this before, but yeah. I'm going to be there for you. I feel like something's going on. Wow. I'm wondering if you'd meet me for breakfast. And she shared in that email a little bit about her history with abuse with her father. It made me so mad because I thought my friend told had told her. her stuff about me. I remember calling my friend being like, what did oh, you do? She's like, I would never do that. So. Oh, God's sovereignty. He right? will find us in despair. It goes back to that four, fourth grade you looking for God. God has been there the whole time. And I know people have this saying or this perspective of like, if God is so good, why does he let the bad things happen? We have to challenge that because we're born into sin and iniquity because of the disobedience. His kingdom is moved forward through the people that choose to obey. We have this notion that if God is the ruler, he can just stop things. This world is dictated by laws and rules and order, and yeah. there has to be people in place that will partner with what God is trying to do. But what Absolutely. happens when you have people who are walking with Jesus, you have abuse cycles. I mean, if God was to dive in and cancel a problem like that, he wouldn't be able to give us free will. This just speaks to his redeeming nature for him to be able to send this woman to reach out to you. Mm -hmm. It be everything you experience to some degree. We could relate on a lot of yeah. levels. I ended up accepting her invitation to have breakfast, which I thought was weird because I was meeting a stranger. She was like, do you want to meet me? I was like, in a busy place with lots of people. I ended up driving there. What was so crazy is I parked my car. And I'm sitting there and I start to hear this narrative or this voice mm -hmm. in my head saying, you're going to go in there and there's going to be a whole bunch of Christians or Bible thumpers. That was the word, Bible thumpers. They're going to do an intervention. I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I want to get out of here. But at the same time, I was like, what does that even mean? Right. Why am I thinking that? I had no knowledge of those terms. My mom is German. My dad's Mexican, but I primarily grew up a Mexican cultural lifestyle. Yeah. So I went to a Mexican Catholic church and I didn't really know anything about Christianity. Yeah. I knew Catholic traditional prayer. Yeah. I didn't know God. Right. I yeah. didn't know the word Christian. Because of that, I was like, Whoa, Whoa, what is this? Being curious, I was like, if there's a Bible or more than one person, I'm going to leave. I go in and it's just her sitting there. I remember sitting down across from her. She had this Montana sweatshirt on. I felt so bad for her. I came in defensive and angry, but then I saw her, she looked mortified. Like it was the scariest thing in the world for her to talk mm. to me, you know, and she just, she's trying not to cry. And she starts to share more of her experiences. And I'm sitting there a little emotional and I'm like, well, you look fine to me. How are you fine? Because I'm not fine. And then she super stutters and she's like, Jesus, you just came out weird. When she said it, I thought, all right, nice to meet you. Got to go. And I left. I had my $20 bill ready to pay the bill. 
peace out because I didn't want to hear that. He hasn't been there for me. I remember going to my car. My heart's pounding. I'm crying. I see her racing past to go to her car. She's upset. I felt so bad, but I end up leaving. But more time goes by. My depression, everything intensified worse, leading to February 27th, 2011. This was... Years of counseling, years of revealing things to my husband, having to heal through those things, fighting with my family, arguing about the truth. I woke up on a Sunday morning before everyone. What was the date? February 27th, 2011. My husband had just bought me a new car. I had a, when the Ford Flexes came out and everybody was like, oh my gosh, I got one of those. I remember getting in my car that morning and I had a plan. There was a bridge that divided Sacramento and this Dust Bowl farm country. So it literally was like the a really big difference, but you had to go over this causeway that was like the highest freeways in Texas. So in my mind, I thought, I'm going to drive off that thing. That will ensure immediate death, right? But Save this was now. before you died in the bathroom? Oh my gosh, I completely... We got to go God. back okay. and talk about this. When I took time off for my sister's wedding, telling my family, I told my family in 2006, things for the next two years. I ended up going to the wedding. He he didn't go. Okay. What ended up happening is I told my parents and then he wrote a confession letter to my parents and they got it in November and it was mailed to them. But it was basically just saying in, in Spanish, you took care of me when my father died mm. and I came to your home and I hurt one of your children. He said, I've been working with the Catholic priest to pay penance for my sins. I hope she can heal now and she can, you know, whatever. And so my mom, the way I found out is my mom ended up showing up at my house and she was like really emotional because she had just found out. I was like, that's nice, but that's not true. He wasn't being honest in the letter. I want to believe him, but that's not true. I'm not the only one. Then I thought like, okay, like my parents really believe it. But then it was like, oh, but now they believe it. The golden child said that, that it happened. And that's how I took it. My mom and dad knew his version of the truth. I just was so discouraged yeah. by how things ended up that I didn't talk to my family again for a while. In that time frame, I think he started to realize that it was going to ruin his life, that people were going to mm -hmm. find out or whatever. So he started like back walking and trying to re-explain the incident as if it was a mutual, which was terrifying to imagine. But and there was a conversation with my mom sometime after where she was kind of like letting me know about mm -hmm. his version. My heart was broken. I remember one night, October of 2008, mm -hmm. I told my husband I was going to go out with my girlfriends for dinner and drinks, but I was going out with my best friend. We knew of a house in Sacramento that was a drug house because this of This wasn't the friend thing. that he called to sit with you? No, okay, no, she's friend. the one who got me to go to Zumba, okay. but this was my other friend. I met her before I got married, so okay. she ended up being my the, um, maid of honor. Me. She was there when my kids were born, very involved okay. in our life. The BF, you tell everything yes. to kind of thing. So she took, we went to a, a drug house in Sacramento, and I remember going into the living room where the girl sold the goods. I still remember everything about the living room. The, color of the couch, the yellow light in the corner, and, you know, just... Mm -hmm. But there was a lot of people at the house. She was sitting on the floor. I was sitting on the couch, and she was sitting on the floor in front of me on the other side of the coffee table, and she was... She was... I basically told her, you know, I just want you to give me something so I can just, like, not be here. I remember she was lacing a blunt with something and chanting, saying, this is going to mess you up. But she had this grin and was so happy. I didn't care. Even though I was scared, yeah. I was like, I just don't want to feel any of this, you know? So she gives me the blunt. I start to smoke it. And quickly after that, I start to feel something's wrong. Mm. It's not just a bad trip. Something is wrong. I felt like I had to go to the bathroom. I throw up. I felt like I was going to pass out. I felt like my heart was like beating weird. And so I got up and found my friends down on the porch I got close to her face and I was like, take me home right now. I remember feeling remorse because she was mad at me. Mm -hmm. You know, she didn't want to be there. She didn't want me to be doing any of that stuff. So she didn't do drugs? No. She just she didn't brought actually. you to the drug I, house. I think I remember trying to offer her to smoke with me a couple of times, but I, I don't remember her except being just a loyal, good friend. friend. The ride home, I don't remember well at all. I remember trying to hold on because I felt like my heart was slowing down. Mm -hmm. 
I got out of the car. She left. I know she was mad. I go to the door, standing at the little night lights on by our door at the apartment. And I'm like, okay. I tell myself, like, you're just going to go in there and you're going to pretend everything's good. That you had a little too much to drink, smoke. I knew I was not normal. Okay, yeah. The brilliant idea you have on drugs is to take more drugs. So I thought if I smoke a bowl in front of my husband, then he'll think, oh, she just had way too much and then came home and had way too much. And we're just going to put her to bed kind of thing. But he's on the couch, kids sleeping, watching the football game. He's having a beer. And I grab, I had this little wooden box that had like some pipes and my little drug box. But I came in the living room and I packed the bowl. Didn't put much in there, but I smoked it. Took one hit and immediately was like, Uh oh "Oh my God, I'm going to die. And so I had this brilliant thought, get up, go to the bathroom and he won't see you die. At the time, we lived in a small apartment. When I stood up and went to the bathroom, it was maybe like four steps to the bathroom door. So I go in the bathroom. As soon as I, like, see my own reflection in the mirror, I lost consciousness. When I fell, it was one of those little bathrooms. It's, like, the sink, the mirror, all that, and then a little, like, a half wall toilet and a shower all close together. When I fell, my head hit the toilet, twisted, and my body bounced between the toilet and the shower. Like the snap of a finger, my soul was hovering over my body. I was aware I wasn't in my body. I could hear my husband screaming, calling my name, begging me to op- open my eyes, wake up, breathe. I'm experiencing this new thing and I'm realizing outside my body, I cannot experience anything that isn't good. I didn't feel sad for him. I didn't feel scared for me. I didn't feel sad for my kids. I just felt good. I felt great. I felt overwhelming joy I remember realizing that I was dying and I kept saying I'm dying I'm dying I was happy about it while this was happening I could feel this presence getting closer from behind and I couldn't turn it was weird because I don't have a body right so I I can't turn my head I was just existing the closer this got to me I felt like I was being enveloped in like perfect Mm -hmm. love like just and the only way I could even remotely explain it is if you ever have been close to a grandparent and they give you a hug and hold you it just there's something about that feeling that is like healing and comforting and you know it was just like yes this is like the best feeling ever it's funny because people say how can god hear us all at the same time you know be everywhere at once or whatever and that's so hard for our natural mind to understand but i understand it better now because outside of my body i was able to be anywhere in the thought so if i thought about my kids i was hovering over their bed i remember seeing them they i remember ethan had a little a zoo it was actually this color he had a little blue t-shirt on and he had he was laying like on his stomach but he had his legs tucked under his belly and then his Mm -hmm. diaper I remember seeing his diaper and just being like you know it's my baby I remember Avery sleeping and and then I hear Garrett every time you would call my name I would immediately go back and I'd see his face as if looking at him through my body but I wasn't it was like boom 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 finally this presence behind me comes up to my left I know it's Jesus. I couldn't see him. I couldn't turn my head. I could, but I knew him better than I've known anyone on earth. He was my home, where I came from, where I was going. I was home. And instead of him telling me, well, you screwed up. Now you're dead. Or these are all things you did wrong. Or let me just real quickly with that explanation throw you into the pit of hell. He was just like talking to me like as if a best friend would sit down and talk to you. And he was saying things like, I created you to be colorful and creative and artistic and and quirky and dorky. I love that about you. I created that because I delight in it. And that's not a mistake. That's who you were created to be. It's funny because I think about it now and it's like he knew That is all I needed. When I was being raised, my mom was extremely verbally abusive and would tear me apart. And and I love my mom. I don't want to put her down, but it was her past and experiences that gave her an example of how to be a mom. I know now she was doing the best she could. A lot of the things my mom did that I felt hurt me, I know now as a parent, she did out of fear. 
because she had yeah. been through some stuff. It's amazing what you can realize. Once you come, like, once you, I can relate a hundred percent. A huge part of my healing was going back home to walk out what I had learned in this retreat stage away from my family where God came after me. And it was like, now it's time to apply it. And I need you to see it from a different perspective. Yeah. And I was able to see that my parents did the best that they could with what they knew to do. Mm -hmm. And that brought so much healing because you take this yoke off your neck and their neck of how it was supposed to be. God knew God is the beginning and the end, so nothing in the middle catches him by surprise. Right. That middle is who we are. It makes up the uniqueness, our testimonies, our experiences, our upbringing. And it just continues to point to his sovereignty and his goodness and redeeming power born yeah. into sin and iniquity. God loves us enough to allow us to heal, to allow us to break through the generational junk so that we don't raise kids that have to heal from their childhood to some degree. But even praying, Lord, may they know you better because of whatever they have to go through yeah. because we don't want to stop them from experiencing anything. That's so good. It's crazy how when you finally have that revelation of that switch of perspective, that thing that once upon a time made you want to kill yourself you, or you felt like there was no way out of this yeah. pain. God redeems it in a way that you can look back and be like, thank you, God, thank that you happened. Lord. You had this near-death experience, and now you're in the presence of the Lord, and there's no condemnation. There's no yeah. fear. There's no torment. Yeah. How did you get back to your body? Oh, my gosh. Well, it felt like, you know, people say, like, time and eternity is so different, and I, it felt like I was talking to him forever, which is amazing. But the Bible says he's a perfect gentleman, right? He asked permission to show me something and I remember my reaction being like, of course, you know, like you're God or whatever. And it was funny because even in that, I was like, how am I so comfortable? Yeah. It's like I just knew. So instead of him, I thought he was going to take me somewhere or play a movie or something, you know, but instead he just started to leave in the same speed and direction he came from. But the further he got away, I couldn't see anymore. I couldn't see my husband. I couldn't hear my husband. I couldn't see my kids. I was being, essentially, it felt like I was being pulled into this black hole that was tightening and getting closer. It was like being pulled into a place that, like when you're falling asleep and you have that jerk because you dream you fell, mm -hmm. it's like that feeling, but it, it yeah, never yeah. stops. You're falling and falling in nothing forever. It's just this pit of your stomach, abandonment. The worst feeling, I would never wish on my greatest enemy. It doesn't matter what you did, who you are, I would never wish that on anyone. It wasn't like I saw hell or demons. I just felt it's what it separate. was like to be in eternity without mm -hmm. Jesus. And while I was feeling that uneasiness, I could still feel him saying, I have you. I'm just showing you this. But I was let so deep into that, I heard this voice. It wasn't what you would imagine a demon's voice would be, but it was this seductive, like, man, you know, and he was like, I got you, you know, you're mine. I remember realizing like, oh my God, like hell is a real place and yeah, there is a demon and this darkness is real. And I started screaming in my spirit, no, 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 I don't want this. And then it was like, the Lord was like, okay, now she gets it. Mm -hmm. Instead of him wishing me goodbye or something, <laughs> he just felt like he was an MLB player and he just threw me back into my body. And I remember taking this big gasp of air and like waking up in my own body and my husband just being pale and weepy over me. Oh my God, you scared me, dang it. You know, like he was so upset. I was just like in a in a crazy mental space because I'm like, what did I just experience? Yeah. What just happened? And being back in my body, reintroduced to pain, fear, anger, and all those things. He had already taken my clothes off. He's, my body started to release fluid. You were technically dead. I was technically dead, yeah. And this so. was 2008, and then it took from 2008 to 2011 for you to surrender. Because you had, yeah. did you have survivors guilt? Oh, or? yeah. We've known a lot of people, especially my husband. He personally has had friends that he grew up with that he loved that were his brothers that have committed suicide. And then I've known people, and why am I still here? Yeah. I felt like I deserved it. But God has a plan. Yeah. He had a plan for me. It was February 27th, 2011. That was when I got saved. Walk us through that. The Zumba instructor is pivotal. The very big part of how I got saved. 
I survived that near-death experience. I'm like a zombie. I have a Medicaid. I went to the doctor, got more medication for depression. They call it major depression disorders. Okay. And finally went back to work. Very robotic. I never quit smoking weed, even though I was told my doctor I had to because of my medication. But I never stopped. Kept going to work. And I remember getting to this point where I'm not going to do this like for the rest of my life. February 27th comes up. When I woke up and went for that drive, expecting to commit suicide, and all the time between when I experienced Jesus in 08 till 2011, I was searching for him. Yeah. I didn't go to church because I was against believers. I didn't even know Christian churches existed. I thought there was wow. like Catholic and Baptist. Okay. You know? like okay. I, those were like no, the two just denominations. One denomination, yeah. yeah, I didn't know. So... I wasn't going to go to the Catholic church, but I was searching for him through spirituality. So a lot of new age things. I had a friend that had gotten into tarot cards and angel cards and all these things. And she had bought me my own deck for my birthday. And it was like gold plated and they were beautiful. And I took them in my purse everywhere and I would read everybody's, you know, reading. And there was an actual peace that came with that and a spiritual experience. But there was a knowing, even though the cards I read for my day, they were right. It felt perverted. But it didn't feel right even though it felt right, you yeah. know? I was so depressed expecting to experience Jesus in those things. Looking for God in all the wrong all, places. All the wrong places, don't we all? Sometimes, right? I mean, in everything. Anyways, that day when I left my house in the morning, I did not plan to come back home. I kissed my kids and they were still sleeping. I went, I left. And, and all of that time I had been looking for Jesus, wanting him almost purposely Oh my God, like a child trying to get your parents' mm -hmm. attention so you keep doing bad things mm -hmm. for them to be like, what? So I kept thinking, if I just keep doing these bad things, I'm going to have experience. I'm going to see him again. Yeah. And it didn't happen. So I'm like, okay, I obviously like burned my bridge with God. So now I'm mm. just going to die. And I guess I'm going to be in eternity wherever. So that was my thought. But I start to drive up this, the very top of this highway and then I hear him. He doesn't say, don't do that. I love you. Nothing like that. I literally got instructions. It was like, get off the freeway, go to Vine Street. Now, Vine Street was in a whole nother city. The only reason I knew about this place was because one of my friends, for, for any of you who didn't know the Lord your whole life, there's this thing out there called the Suicide Girls. It's an online network of girls on camera, like burlesque, to get attention, likes. It still exists today. There's shows that travel. I met this girl in that city who was a suicide girl, part of that lifestyle. She had taken me there because I had told her about how I love Victorian homes and okay. they're really beautiful, all that stuff. So that street is the kind of homes where you sit there and you're like, whoa. I had instructions to go to that street. It was him speaking to me. I knew it was him, even though it made no sense. I was obedient. Mm -hmm. I got off the freeway, bawling my eyes out, hysterical. Drive all the way another 30 minutes to that city, go on that street, park my car, and I'm sitting there. And I feel peace because I'm sitting surrounded by so much beauty. Yeah. But then it's like, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So I get frustrated, really, God. I start to leave the street, but the only way at that time to get into the street and out of the street is the same entrance and exit. I turn around, start to drive out, and when I drove out of that street, on the right, there was a bat of downtowns, all the businesses that are on the downtown strip, and it's a big, empty parking lot. On the left, there's just a bunch of Victorian houses. Okay. So I drive out, I look to the right, and I'm looking at this big, empty parking lot, and my phone starts to ring. Well, I got a new car and it was my first car that had Bluetooth. My phone was connected and my car was ringing. I didn't know how to hang up or whatever because I didn't want to answer the call. But there's that little picture of the phone on the steering wheel yes. and I pressed it to hang up, but it answered. And it was Angie, the Zumba instructor. She's like, is that you? I'm in the parking Way. lot. I look over and she is the only car in the parking lot standing at her trunk. I guess she was taking stuff into one of the buildings that was there. And I'm hysterical. I don't even sound right. She's like, just come here, please, just come here. So I drive into the parking lot park. She gets in my car. I'm bawling. I can't articulate what I'm experiencing, what I'm feeling. And she's like, you know what? I'm going to tell my husband that we're going to go for a drive. She leads into the back of this building. I'm waiting quite a bit of time. All of a sudden, other cars start showing up. Mm -hmm. And these families are coming out. And I notice this one family, it's like this guy and this girl and they have like four or five kids but they're like tattooed from the bottom of their chin down and 
they're dressed up for like Sunday church and they're, they got a Bible, you know, they're going to the back of this building. I'm like, what the heck? More cars start showing up. And I'm just like, is this a church? Like, what kind of church is this? Curiosity was just like, Angie hadn't come back out yet. I just had this thought growing up. If you got tattooed or did certain things, mm-hmm. you were going to help. So here I am seeing all these younger people that are tattooed because I'm tattooed like my whole body. So I'm thinking yeah. they're going into a church that is accepting of them. I just have to know. So I go in the back door. I've always been that kid. Like, I'll do it. If anyone's like, truth or dare, I go in. And immediately when I walk in the same, the foyer or whatever, I felt Jesus. Mm-hmm. I felt his spirit. I felt familiarity. I felt peace. I was like, oh. This is what I've been looking for. And then there's another double door, and that goes into the sanctuary. And so these greeters kind of welcomed me in. And I walk in, and everybody's got their hands raised, and they're worshiping, and there's live music, and there's drums. And I'm just like, what on earth? What is going on here? Then I heard the the Spirit of God say, come to the altar. I didn't know what an altar was. In the middle of this poor church's Sunday morning service, uh, this stranger walks down the middle aisle and falls to my knees. I hear the Lord tell me, I'm going to take it now. And I'm on my knees, bawling hysterically. I have context because I understand when people are delivered from demons, sometimes it's a physical, sometimes people vomit, mm-hmm. sometimes whatever. But I literally felt like there was like that CrossFit rope that was in me and he was pulling it, just all the pain. And I was just like, sobbing and sobbing and I remember hearing the pastor go up to the mic and tell the audience you know or the people say he said we're just gonna continue worship so the band just kept playing and and I just kept having my moment with God and I remember this woman came over and kind of pushed a box of tissue next to me and walked away I was grateful she didn't touch me yeah but there's this scripture and I cannot remember for life of me but it says I'll put on the ro- robe of righteousness mm-hmm. I was on my knees, but I wasn't buckled. It felt like when your mom takes a a towel or a blanket out of a dryer and puts it on you, I felt that on my shoulders and I buckled. I was just like, oh my gosh. After what seemed like forever of crying my eyes out and peace, I stood up realizing I was in this strange building with these strange people. I just ran out the back door. People were like, oh, and I was like, no, I'm out of here. So I walk out, I run outside and I remember just running to go to my car, totally forgot about Angie. And I remember hearing bird chirping and it stopped me in my tracks because I could not remember the last time that I heard birds chirping. And I'm not even kidding you. I felt like the sky was like the Simpsons, you know, like dun, dun, yeah. dun. Like, I mean, the clouds looked so beautiful and healthy. Yeah. And my eyes were open. And all I could think was, I just want to go home and be with my family right now, you know. And I just got in my car and like flew home. And the, I don't even know how fast I was driving, but I was driving really fast. I remember people driving by and me looking over like, and almost like, because I'm such a, I'm an outward kind of person. I'm like, wear my heart on my sleeve. So I remember, this is so funny, but I remember people driving by and me like driving and being like, it's different. I remember getting home and at the, at the time, one of my friends was there and my husband was like furious because I had been missing and wasn't answering my calls or anything or his calls and he didn't know where I was. I get out of the car and I'm like, I keep my life to Jesus. He's just like, whoa, dude. Wait a minute, you yeah. know, so that was, Day and that's and a whole nother. Yeah, because you know? it took him, what, about two, three years? No, it was about seven years before he fully surrendered. Please share just a little bit of oh. that story. We are currently writing a book telling our story. He was not on board. He was happy for me. Yeah. He, he didn't think it was going to last. He thought it was very weird and temporary. He kept yeah. expecting me to smoke every day and take my pills, which I was this is not normal. I was radically delivered from alcohol and drug abuse. Some are not. And yeah. they have to, and whatever, for whatever reason, they have to go through that healing. But the Lord, I was delivered. Yeah. So like, I had no desire to do any of that. In the evenings, I grabbed my journal because I didn't know how to process everything I was mm-hmm. going through besides writing it down. My whole life is different. Something happened. I just immediately started documenting. And I remember just the day after, a couple of days after, whatever, I was sitting on the couch and I wrote my first 
journal entry, God, what just happened to me? Yeah, I know yeah. this happened for a reason. But my husband started to notice days and days and days passing where I was happy. I wasn't having panic attacks. I was Uber. Yeah, all these yeah. things that he was just kind of like, okay, well, there's something to this. Yes. He did go to church with us. Not all the time, but he did. He struggled so much mm -hmm. with it. And the thing that I did that was wrong was I didn't know because I didn't understand religion, legalism. I just knew that this incredible, beautiful, amazing God gave me healing and freedom. I wanted to be perfect for him. Mm -hmm. I was at a church that was that leaned more towards a legalism or religious, mm -hmm. you know, even though. So you didn't go back to the church that you. I did. OK. I, oh, yeah. That's how I like because I was like, what happened? Like, yeah. I need somebody to explain. Yeah. I walked in on a weekday and the church secretary was like, oh, you'll have to make an appointment. So mm -hmm. I made the appointment, met with the pastor and I told him my story and he was just like blown away, you know. But he said, yeah, we will never forget you. Yeah. Like we all, you know, we all saw what happened. That was how our marriage was, me going to church but with, by myself or with the kids and him staying home. What I didn't realize is that the enemy will always use the person closest to you. Mm. My husband was never aggressive. or He didn't have an evil way of yeah. him or an evil presence. Whenever I'd come home from Bible studies or church, he'd yeah. be mad, irritated. How long are you going to be there? Is this how it's yeah. always going to be? You know, he would just be so irritated. I don't know what happened with my wife. I want my wife back. I didn't know what to say. All I could tell him was, you need to repent and you give your life to Jesus. And this pushed him further yeah. away. And the Wednesday night worship, I went and I told the Lord, because I used to go every weekend, mm. every altar call, bawling my eyes out, begging God to fix my husband, save my husband. I went to church that night. I told the Lord, I'm not going to pray for my husband mm. tonight. Just worship you with my heart because of what you've done for me. I went up to the altar, stood next to the speaker so I could speak out loud in my worship and not have people hear my, my words. But I had my hands in the air, having a wonderful time worshiping, thanking him. He interrupts me and says, give me Garrett. Girl. And he just was like, give me Garrett. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I, and I'm crying, screaming over the speakers. I had given him to you. I anointed him underwear and everything and the lord's like give me garrett i did not understand what he was what asking me to do and all mm -hmm. of a sudden the prophet of the house miss dolly she was this beautiful she is this beautiful woman she's you know she was always with her high heels on at the altar cutting the rug <laughs> i would say but in the middle of worship and i'm having this argument with god she comes over and she whispers in my ear just say yes I realized I needed to surrender my husband, stop trying to change him, let him be him, and let God deal with it. I was the problem. So I said, yes, it fell out in the spirit. Laying on the floor, hands open, and I'm just sobbing and sobbing. Eventually, I got up, and I was like, whoa. After that, every time I went to church, I came home, there was peace. My husband wasn't mad. Wow. And God moved quickly. Soon after, the Lord told me 2017 was my year of healing. Mm -hmm. I ended up having an opportunity shortly after that experience to go back to Mexico for three weeks with my dad and my siblings so that I could, like, heal from yeah. things. And they didn't know that was my agenda, but I knew I needed to go back yeah. to have this healing. I went, and when I prepared to leave, I wrote my husband a letter, put it on his pillow. I know you love me. I know you'll do anything in the world for me. So it would, it would be everything in the world to me that you take our kids to church mm -hmm. while I'm gone. They need to go to church. And he, he never text me or called me or responded. I didn't know how things were working out or whatever, but he was taking them to church. Wow. Salvation moment is his story to tell, but he was there one of the last Sundays before I came back. The pastor was giving an illustrated sermon, and I guess it was kind of funny and everyone was laughing, but my husband was, it was like there was a sermon Ooh. inside the yeah. just for him, and he was losing it. When church ended, he went home, and he told me that he just, you know, got on his knees in our bed and was like, God, you know, if you're real, like, whatever, I surrender. Yeah. He just had this moment where he was like, oh, my gosh, I get it now. And so it was really cool coming back from Mexico. And I actually came back, and I was so sick. Like, yeah. I always get sick when I go to Mexico. I don't know what it is, the water or what, yeah. but I got so sick. So he waited three days. He was so excited to tell me. But I remember when he told me, I was like, and I was almost mad at God. He was like, you don't even earn the right to watch this miracle happen. You'll be over I'm there. Dead. I'll deal with you and him separately. And now here you are. Y'all are in your 22nd year. We just celebrated our 21st and 20. we've been together 24 years. Moved from Cali to Texas and... Both your children love the Lord, and yeah. they're going through their own individual walks of coming to know him as father. Wow. 
Wow. Grateful for your vulnerability and testimony. It's unconventional. It's not the traditional. It's just not a traditional story. And women, men need to hear just the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When I sat down with Ashley, she talked about grief and Mm. how she had to walk through the death of her sister. When I talked to Deanna, she had to talk through submission, like not losing her individuality in the submittance and the surrendering of being under her husband as her provider. And right. now you walked us through your story of how, one, you met God in your marriage through addiction, through pain and anguish, suicide ideation and attempts. And God said, no, we thank God. I thank God for your life, for your testimony, for we overcome by the blood of the lambs and the words of our testimony. And through your pain, you birthed your ministry mosaic. Please share what that looks like and how God is using that to help you redefine what womanhood looks like outside of what the Bible has or what people have done to abuse the Bible with right. making us feel like we have to be prim and proper and fit in a box. Yeah, no yeah. box of here. I, well, I think the hill I'll die on, right? Mm -hmm. I died. I met Jesus. He told me everything about me that everyone said was annoying and weird mm -hmm. is what he created me to be. So yeah. I'm going to own it. And that's yeah. not going to change even if I end up in a rigid church that period. You know what I mean? It's like I just and so that was what kind of like birth mosaic was like I was in this church and there were amazing people. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it was bad. It's just churches are different. It was an intern. And then everyone married someone from the internship and mm -hmm. looked the same. Everyone was a real estate agent. And it was just like, why does this feel like we're, you know, and I'm struggling with changing who I am, even yeah. though I know I'm not supposed to. That was a battle with me. But then other women came into the church through the years. I was there, I think, eight years Wow. that were like me, who had even more difficult pasts where they were carrying shame and prostitution or yeah. they had just gotten out of rehab. They lost their kids to the, you know, to the system because they screwed up or whatever. Like there was women that were just so much more vulnerable yeah. that came in and didn't have my experience right. of dying and meeting Jesus had less to hold on to just hope Hebrews 6 19 is one of my favorite scriptures they had that hope that is something they can count on but then they're looking to the church like okay but you're a part of this so why don't you feel like this you know and these women were coming in there were men too but I'm specifically talking about women where they would get rejected and no one's going to admit that they rejected them but mm -hmm. the club you know That's the clicks the, yeah they don't fit which you know, is why I love, love our sister. church. We love you at church, but right. we're not going to hang out with you outside no. the church. I, in DLI, I remember learning a lot of people are like, nobody likes me. I don't have any friends. The Bible says you need to be friendly to have friends. And I knew that these people don't really care for me because I'm not fit in their box, but I'm going to make them love me. I'm going to come to all the things, even if I'm not invited. Yeah. I just kind of did that. It broke my heart. All the women I saw try to fit in, mm -hmm. not fit in, and leave and go back to the world and end up way worse off than they were when they came the first time. I was like, this can't be a thing. The Lord started giving me directions on what to do. Go back to school, get this license, get ordained, all these steps. And which led to me starting Mosaic. Yes. Mosaic Women's Collective is a ministry for women like myself mm -hmm. who don't fit into church culture. It's a ministry to tell them that they are perfectly loved by God, no matter their background. At the conference, we did our launch mm -hmm. in May. It was mostly about, you know, our experiences that were had to do with, you know, diversity or our race or, right. you know, being the only black girl, being yeah. the only white girl, yeah. being the only, you know, one who did drugs or yeah. had an abortion or whatever. So we had all these, all these women share their stories, which was so powerful. Yeah. And then a little, a little sneak peek into Mosaic 2025 oh. is we're going to be bringing up worship style. Okay. So oh. that's another wall that comes up in the church, you know? Oh, that person's waving flags and they're hitting tambourines. Like they're, yeah, they're that weird and that's not godly. moving their head. You know, yeah. And it's not seductive and it's not provocative. Right. They've learned to give all the worship being. Right. This is And good. my husband, his form of worship, he's always been a heavy metal guy. Mm -hmm. He loves, you know, that, that kind of music, that screamo and just, you know, and I'm sometimes I'm like, uh, you know, because I liked it more when I was younger. But now, unless I know the lyrics or um, understand, them, since he's been saved, he's fallen in love with these bands who, I mean, you you think worship music is good. When you hear the, these songs and you read the lyrics with the screaming, you will be bawling. Like the lyrics are so incredible. 
And so my husband and I have this this long going joke that if we started a church, the worship would be a screamo. I'm here for it. You know, so but for my husband, I brought him up because, you know, he's like me. We're both tattooed from the neck down. It's, yeah. it's just who we are. And it's an expression of who we are. It's an expression of our life experiences. After he gave his life to Christ, we moved to Texas. A lot of really great things happened. My family as a whole, all four of us had this amazing encounter with God that had to do with moving. And so when we moved here, my husband, his way of worship was to go to a tattoo shop, okay. lay face down for eight hours while his entire back got tattooed. And it was this beautiful portrait of Jesus and all of the symbols, the, the nails, the doves, so intricate. Is and your back tat? No, okay, not like okay. that. But to him, he laid there in tears because that was his form of worship. worship. It's like, Lord, this pain I'm going through doesn't even touch an ounce yeah, of what you had gone through for my sins, That's you good. know? And so my goal in Mosaic for 2025 is to open the eyes because at a Mosaic 2024 at the conference, we broke down some walls. Yeah, We were like, look, y'all, we are sisters. Yeah. There is no difference. We all need to understand we're all struggling. We're all yeah. going through the same things. We all have the same insecurities. Yeah, Like, you're not alone. Right. And then this year, we're going to knock down the walls of worship styles. We're going to stop judging. We're going to stop being in church, staying in the middle of worship with our arms crossed because we don't like how Susie is worshiping God. I would never forget mm-hmm. hearing a preacher share an encounter scheduled to teach. Worship was going on and they didn't like the song. Mm-hmm. The sound was off. One of the mothers in the faith, Cindy Jacobs, was in worship. And through talking with her and the conviction of the Lord, the Lord reminded him that you don't come to church to hear a song, to focus on what other people are doing or to critique. And I know that's even something I'm convicted in because I have this gifting of being able to discern like just perversion or things that are off through a sound. Yeah. We come to worship to seek the Lord. The Bible says, blessed are the pure at heart for they shall see God. Even if there is sin in the congregation, God honors his word found in Matthew 5. God is going to let his presence be known through those who seek him. Mm -hmm. I even had to accept rebuke when I would critique my husband on the way that he worshiped or Mm -hmm. we don't worship the same. And one of the things I respect about both of our men is they never have tried to quench our individuality. They've never tried to make us be something that we're not. I've had an idea of what I thought my man should do and worship. You should worship this way. And God's just like... (laughs) He not doing that to you, so why are you doing it to him? My husband checked me several times, like, why are you watching me when you should have your eyes on the Father? The goal in those moments is to have this vertical relationship, not horizontal, where you're like, what are they doing? I was like, I'm trying to commune with you. I want to spend time with you, but you're so focused on everything else. Yeah, that's super common. I used to get mad at Garrett for not raising his hands. He wouldn't do it. I would be like... So embarrassing. Why won't he do it? Or his heart isn't right. Or always focused. Eventually, I realized that because God had to, to speak to me yeah. about it, I needed to let that go and let him yeah. be who he is. I've seen my husband who doesn't worship loudly and isn't super outward in his faith, but I've seen God use him mightily, yes. Yes. powerfully. And so it's really like, wow. When we were seeing somebody going crazy in their worship, we don't know what they've been delivered that from. Part. That celebration is personal, intimate. We have to respect, honor, it, and see it as beautiful instead yeah. of annoying or distracting. Most of the time, the thing we don't like about other people is what we don't like about ourselves. Ooh. So maybe we're not free like they are, and we're judging them. One thing I respect about our church is that we don't consider ourselves non-denom. We consider us interdenominational because we're a conglomerate of all the experiences of people who make up the congregation and that is why we can worship freely and be who we are and it's okay I think one of the things and we'll close on this is like who we think we are may not be who God is calling us to be and a lot Mm -hmm. of time the tension and the grief is finding ourselves in between who we thought we were and where God is taking us there are aspects of us that will go into the future Sometimes we have to put all of us on the altar for God to refine it and that which will stand will remain. 
Mm-hmm. And I know that even yeah. in this marriage, I thank God that I learned God as father and friend before I got married. It's beautiful to hear your testimony of how you found mm-hmm. God as father and friend through your marriage. They both speak to the sovereignty of God, the uniqueness of our callings and the women we are called to. I thank God for his intentionality. And we both relate on this idea of who we thought we were, but the reality of, of where God is taking us. And marriage is that refining fire. I used to be very, like we were talking about releasing control. I did all the finances for a, a little bit. I made more money. Eventually when God was working on my husband, God was telling me to surrender those yeah, things to I'm him. There. It was tough, but I'm now reaping the fruit of that. Okay, but there is hope. Husbands have that protection o- over us. And one thing that used to make me so mad is Garrett, I'd, I'd introduce Garrett to somebody new, a new friend. And he would be like, here's the reasons why. Okay. And I would just be like, that's rude. You don't even know them. You're going to judge them, whatever. But months later, I'd be like, you were right. It's literally I'm going to listen life. to you now. We've been together 24 years in the last two years, really taking his discernment seriously. 24 like, years. <laughs> My one. One thing I wanted to say about Mosaic is, you know, this ministry is... I feel like God has asked me to do something that's extremely difficult, especially the environment that we're living in today. I know it's needed, but there's a lot of opposition. It's not just the people of the world. People in the church make me want to quit ministry. I was recently at a leadership conference, and one of the breakout sessions was women in ministry. And I've never gone to those because I've never been a woman in ministry technically, right, right. but now I have my own women's ministry. I'm not because of who I am. I never, I never tried to change for anyone. People come to these things in Easter dresses, just real proper, which is cool. You look great. But me, I'm going to wear my bell bottoms, yeah. my Harley t-shirt, my funky earrings. Yeah. This particular day, we had to stay in a hotel. I didn't have an ironing board. I wore bell bottom jeans, a regular t-shirt. I think it had a small scripture on it. I had my Harley Davidson hat because okay. my hair was, you know, yeah. whatever. I go to this meeting knowing I'm going to meet these women, and the lady running it says, hey, I want everyone to stand in front of each other. We're going to do some speed dating kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Just introduce who you are, what you do, and then go to the next person. I walk in looking around. I don't know. So one. Dumb, yeah. you know? And everyone's double looking at me like, who's this chick? And I'm just powering through. I'm like, folk, keep my eyes on Jesus. I get in this line, and for the most part, the women were kind. We'd all reach out your hand. Hi, nice to meet you. My name's whatever. I went through it, and and I did see on their faces, because body language is more powerful than anything sometimes, I could tell they were just like, "Uh, hi, nice to meet you. You're very hesitant. Yeah, I'm just like, and for the glory of God, I kept myself together and was kind, introduced myself. We get to the end, and I literally, this whole time I'm fine. I'm so used to people judging me, so it's not a big thing. But I get to this woman, and I go, hey, I'm Lisa. She goes to put her hand out, then gets a good look at me, and she puts her hand back and then covers it with her other hand and goes, oh, you must be non-denom. Janae, Janae. Melissa, please. I felt like I got punched in the throat. She just went, boom. And I would have been high, and you (laughs) must be legalistic. God has given me grace not to respond that way. I can't do it, the Lord. I just can't. To your calling, okay? How did you respond? Well, I wanted to cry. I was trying not to cry, but I was like, oh, yeah. I made it a joke. I was like, oh, yeah, we are non-denominational. Ha, ha, ha. What's your name? When I left, there was a long walk from that class to lunch. My whole body was trembling and I wanted to cry. They say what you're most passionate about is what God has called you to do, right? So I knew that that emotion was confirmation as to what I was called to do. And it happened again this last weekend. I went to another conference for leaders. And at the end, there was a panel. These people, they're all leaders from church. They're all pastors. They're all in ministry. They were taking the mic and passing it around. They were asking the panel questions. One of the pastors that was preaching was Alex Suber, and he was talking about how you know, we need to be more supportive of this generation and really just meet them where they're at kind of thing. He was giving some really great examples. And so this guy brings up a question alluding to something that he had said. And he says, well, what are we supposed to do when the person we're trying to minister to is tattoos and colored hair and funky clothes when everything about them repels you? Repel, repulsive is such a Oh, derogatory, disrespectful description. When you truly encounter Jesus, you can't have that heart anymore. Your heart is made new. 
You are covered in the blood of Jesus. You are given a different perspective. Hey, I cannot understand how people can be in a church 20, 30 years and still have their heart, heart like hardened. that. Hardened. There's no you. encounter. The encounter demands transformation. The humility, forgiveness. That's the first thing that God asked me to do, forgive. I forgave that woman from the conference. I That's forgave that man immediately. Issue. But I still carry it. I drove home from the conference in tears. Yeah. Just like, God, you have asked me to face these types of yes. people. Te help me do the right they could what they're doing yes. is harmful girl you're yeah. the woman for the job because of everything you've gone through because you have a supportive husband who will champion you because to some degree we enabling has like this two-edged sword like for example to heal people who are confident in who they are i'm bold i go after what god said and i stand strong on his promises yeah but to the broken or the unhealed the offended I'm blunt, I'm rude, I'm disrespectful. And those are the same, they're anonyms in a sense, but mm -hmm. it just depends on the lens. Yeah. So your husband may have seemed like an enabler in the broken world, but he's a champion, your number one fan, and yeah. he's the one who Absolutely. you can lean on in these yeah. moments. And so I am, one, elated that you have accepted the call mm -hmm. and that you're going to go forth in boldness and... I want to encourage you even just publicly. I know that there are some things even just going on in life at this moment. I feel the Lord is saying this is an opportunity with your family to see the growth, mm. to see the manifestation of all the years that have led to this moment where your response shows your healing. Oh, it's gosh. not necessarily the worst time in the enemy. This is the Lord shaking the foundation so you can see your roots have been planted deeply like the yeah. the tree in psalms Ooh. one I, I want you to be encouraged and take a different perspective this had to happen and be revealed on this side of your testimony walk identity because god needed to show you that you are where he needs you to be you've done the work necessary so this speaks to your ability to talk about walking through but also remaining mm -hmm. when things get tough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, great. I love you and I'm excited you are here today. I know the women will be blessed. For those new here, my name is Janae Carly. My goal is to help you grow and life, faith, and business. And drop some stuff in the comments. This won't be the last time. Melissa will grace us with her presence. If you have any questions specifically, I will connect you to her Mosaic ministry. Until next time, holla.